Hello and welcome back to Cup of Science, the online show that is bringing you your weekly dosage of science. I am your host, Phil Bell Young, and in today's prescribed show, we dive into the world of medical science with Alex Baker from the University of Warwick as he answers the question, when does medicine become a drug? Plus, special guest Marty Jobson will be turning the ordinary into the extraordinary as he takes us through the looking glass and into a microscopic world. And as always, we will be finishing off with questions and answers with you, our wonderful audience. But before any of that, once again, welcome to our show from wherever you are in the world. We have been on a short break these last few weeks, but we are now back with a killer new intro created by our very own producer extraordinaire, Michelle Kinnan, and have put together three more episodes to fill that pint of science shaped hole in all our lives. Um, also, you can find out more about all these events that are coming up by visiting the Pint of Science website, which is pintofscience.co.uk. We will put the links up very shortly. Uh, finally, if you want to, please stay in touch with us throughout tonight's show using the comment section beneath this live feed or on Twitter using at Pint of Science or at Philby91, which is me, or the hashtag hashtag cuppa science. But for now, it's that time of the night where we grab a cuppa, don't forget the biscuits, and let's get started. Our featured guest tonight is, oops, our featured guest tonight is an organic chemist and PhD researcher from the Gibson Group at the University of Warwick. His work focuses on making rapid diagnostic devices for a wide, wide range of diseases that are cost effective. Most recently, he has been involved in the development in a less invasive COVID-19 test that is very similar to how a pregnancy test works. Alongside his research, he is also heavily involved in science communication, public engagement, and schools outreach at the University of Warwick, and even co-chairs a group that researches issues around diversity in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Ladies and gentlemen, please raise a cup for Alex Baker. Ooh. Thanks, Phil, uh, and good evening, everyone. As Phil said, I'm an organic chemist, and I spend most of my time making new molecules from carbon building blocks. And what really fascinates me is how these small chemical changes can actually have a huge effect. This one carbon change can really affect how a molecule behaves. Now, this is especially true for medicines. So today, I want to talk about the thin chemical line that separates medicines from illicit drugs. A quick point about chemical structures before I begin though. Now in chemistry lessons at school, you may have seen the structures on the left where every atom is given its elemental symbol from the periodic table and every line is its own chemical bond. Now at university, we remove the carbons and any hydrogens bound to those carbons from our structures to make them easier to read. That's because carbon and hydrogen are incredibly common in organic chemistry. And what we are left with are known as skeletal structures, where every connection is a carbon with the right number of hydrogens attached to it. To start with then, let's have a look at these two chemicals. Now these molecules aren't particularly groundbreaking, but when you give them a small amount of oxygen, as I can do now, they will change color. The addition of oxygen to the reaction allows the molecules to rearrange their structures and shift hydrogens and electrons around. Eventually, they will go back to being clear and colorless as they rearrange their hydrogens and electrons again. Now, as I said, these molecules, they're not particularly world changing, but they do illustrate a good point that a very simple chemical change of moving only a few hydrogens can have dramatic consequences on how a chemical behaves. So this is the point of my talk today, to show you that simple 
chemical changes change the world. And that when these changes are made to medicines, well, the effects can be disastrous. Medicines can go from chemicals that heal us to those that cause harm. Now, I'm going to illustrate this today by answering two questions. First, why is heroin so addictive? And the second, why is half of all methamphetamine inactive? To answer the first, well, we have to go back to ancient times, to the Sumerian civilization who lived over 5,000 years ago in present day Iraq. The people in this region, they were cultivating a plant they called whole gill, the joy plant, known to us today as the opium poppy. Now, the juices of the poppy, well, they could be used from anything from anesthetics for major surgery to benign headache cures. Now, the use of the poppy was then spread across the ancient world to Greece and Egypt, where the plant would actually be worshipped like a god. And it would then later spread further into Europe and China, where in 1527, it would be rediscovered in the Dark Ages by the alchemist Paracelsus. However, it wasn't until 1804 that the active ingredient of the poppy Morphine was isolated by a German chemist called Saturna. Now, during this time, the popularity of opium and morphine as drugs was really starting to go global. In China, the problem of opium use was in fact so bad that the Chinese government wanted to stop opium imports flooding into China. Now, this is unsurprising, as annual opium imports into China in the 1850s dwarfed current global production of opium by a factor of 10. Unfortunately, however, the British Empire disagreed with the Chinese and forced the Chinese at gunpoint to take the opium. This was drug dealing on a colossal scale, but it would lead to the ceding of Hong Kong to the UK in 1842. Now, in this period, opium and morphine were often smoked or taken orally for recreational medicinal uses. And it wasn't until 1844 that the first hypodermic injection of morphine would be carried out. Now this solved the problem of accidentally overdosing your patient when you gave morphine orally. So this brings us to the current use of morphine in the NHS, where it is used as a potent painkiller for heart attacks, post-surgical pain relief, and palliative care. But how does it work? Well, when you experience pain, it's because your nerve impulses are traveling through your neurons to the brain across nerve junctions carried by chemical neurotransmitters. When you take morphine, it enters your brain, and binds to opioid receptors on the junctions of your neurons. This prevents neurotransmitters from being released into the nerve junctions, stopping the nerve impulses in your brain so you literally don't feel pain. Now the issue with morphine and other opioids, however, is that over time your body starts to adapt to the morphine by decreasing the pain-killing effect it has. This means you need more and more morphine to get the same response. And in turn, this can lead to dependence and addiction. Therefore, the holy grail of addiction-free morphine has been the pursuit of doctors and researchers for years. Now, one such researcher was a, a man called Charles Alderwright. And in 1874, Alderwright was attempting to make addiction-free morphine. He was doing this by reacting pure acetic acid, a key ingredient of vinegar, with morphine. And he successfully made a chemical called diacetyl morphine by adding two acetyl groups. He started then testing it on small animals and realized that it only had a very similar effect to morphine, so it really didn't take it any further. Now, as you'll see later on, if only that was really the end of this story for diacetyl morphine. Because in the late 1890s, a German dye manufacturer was starting to branch out into pharmaceuticals by attempting to make addiction-free morphine. They carried out the same reaction as all the right and realized it was a good painkiller but that diacetyl morphine, well, it wasn't a very catchy name. So they called it heroin because it made you feel invincible like a hero. They then started to market it as a cure for toothache and headache alongside their other invention, aspirin. 
Now, this pharmaceutical company is now called Bayer, and it is worth over 100 billion US dollars. But at the time, they thought heroin was the non-addictive solution to morphine. But now we know it is, in fact, highly addictive. So in the UK, it is a class A drug. So why is heroin so addictive? When the only difference between heroin and morphine are two acetyl groups. Well, in 1972, an experiment was carried out on rats. The experiment was set up to explore how easily opioids such as morphine moved across the blood-brain barrier. Now, this is a thin wall that separates your blood from your brain tissue. Now, in the experiment, some rats were injected with morphine, and after 15 seconds, they were decapitated. And the amount of morphine on either side of the blood-brain barrier was then measured. It was found that after 15 seconds, no morphine had entered the brain of the rat. The same was then done with rats based on heroin. However, after 15 seconds, 63% of the heroin injected into the rat's blood was now in the rat's brain. It turns out that heroin is more soluble inside the fat of the blood-brain barrier and brain than morphine. This means it moves across the blood-brain barrier far more effectively. To illustrate this, what I have here are two solids in liquids they are not soluble in. However, when I add a liquid they are soluble in, you can quickly see they move from the soluble layer, from the insoluble layer into the soluble layer. In fact, even when we try and make them go back into the insoluble solvent they were originally in, well, they won't. Now, this is important because for something to be chemically active, it must be able to reach its target. If it has to go through a solvent or layer it is not soluble in, then it simply won't reach its target. Think of it like this. A T-Rex, well, it's land-based. It can only hunt on land. If you stick a T-Rex in the sea, you will quickly realize that the T-Rex no longer functions as normal, and the T-Rex will try and get out of the water at all costs. In this way, heroin is like a T-Rex. Both are poorly water-soluble. Both prefer non-water-based environments. Now consider this. Drop a T-Rex just off the coast. It will quickly swim to shore, and now that it is back on land, it will start being active again. This is just like heroin injected into your blood. Heroin quickly moves out of your watery blood into the nice fat environment of the blood-brain barrier and then on into the fatty brain tissue. When heroin is inside the fatty environment of the brain, the majority of the heroin molecules are actually broken down within about 10 minutes to what's known as monoacetylated morphine, and then within 30 minutes to morphine. Both morphine and monoacetylated morphine are known to be active in the brain. This means that for heroin to have any effect, it must be broken down into its active morphine derivatives. In this way, heroin is actually a prodrug. It has no activity itself until it is broken down into its active morphine forms. So why is heroin so addictive? Well, a simple chemical change that adds two acetyl groups massively increases its solubility in the brain and the blood-brain barrier. So it is driven across the blood-brain barrier far more effectively than morphine. Once it is in the brain, it is broken down back to morphine. So heroin is, in fact, a great way to transport morphine more effectively into the brain. This is why heroin is so addictive. It is simply more soluble in your brain than morphine. Now, this simple addition of two acetyl groups to morphine costs the U.S. $50 billion a year, despite only 0.2% of its population using heroin. This simple chemical change of adding what is basically concentrated vinegar to morphine has truly changed the world. This is the same vinegar that when you put on that you put on your fish and chips when it's diluted. And I think that's some food for thought when you're next down the chippy. Question two then: why is half of all methamphetamine inactive? Well, N-dimethylphenethylamine is a medicine used mainly in the US as a nasal decongestant. Interestingly though, this medicine is what is known as an enantiomer. 
It is a molecule that has a non-overlapping mirror image. If you take both your hands and hold them out in front of you with palms facing away from you, they are mirror images of each other, but they do not overlap. In this way, your hands are an antimus of each other. They are mirror images, but they do not overlap when facing in the same direction. Now the wedge bond on the structures here indicates the bond coming out of the screen rather than flat with the screen. And I've marked the wedge with a red circle on the structures so you can more easily see that they are non-overlapping mirror images. Now antimers are found in lots of places in chemistry. For example, here are the two enantiomers of limonene. The left-hand one has a bond going into the screen and gives lemons their smell, so it's added to food and perfume. The right-hand one has a bond coming out of the screen and smells like turpentine or petrol. So unsurprisingly, it isn't added to perfumes. This is a simple difference that could cost the perfumer their job and you a night on the sofa. The only difference is one bond facing either up or down. Now the bottom pair of enantiomers on your screen, they're the enantiomers of carbon, a chemical only a few hydrogens and an oxygen different from limonene. The left enantiomer gives caraway seeds their smell and the right gives spearmint its smell. Again, the difference of a bond going up or down changes their smell, their taste, and their use. So in the case of limonene and carbone, a simple chemical change dramatically affects how your body reacts and smells the chemical. In medicine, enantiomers can be a huge problem. The enantiomer of our nasal decongestant is methamphetamine, commonly known as meth. Meth is a drug that causes euphoria, increased self-confidence, and reduced fatigue as it leads to massive dopamine release. It was actually used, by, used in the Second World War by the Germans as a stimulant to keep their soldiers awake and in the field for longer. Now the issue with these two enantiomers of methamphetamine is you cannot make one of them without the other. Whenever you synthesize the medicine, you also get the drug. And the only way you can separate them is after you've made them. This is why half of all enantiomers methamphetamine is inactive as a drug, because the other half is a nasal decongestant. Now, whilst this probably doesn't mean that a drug dealer will give you a 50% discount, it does highlight an interesting quirk of chemistry, that even molecules that contain the same atoms in the same places can have different reactions and effects on the body. Now, to separate the drug from the medicine, you would have to run them through a chromatography column. This allows you to separate the two enantiomers based on their solubility. For example, if A is more soluble than B, A will pass through the column faster. Therefore, we can collect A before B even leaves the column. This allows us to separate our enantiomers. However, this technique is difficult to do on a large scale, it is time consuming, and it requires a lot of skill. So unsurprisingly, most drug dealers don't do it. So half of all methamphetamine is inactive for two reasons. One, the reaction to synthesized meth produces two enantiomers. And two, you can only separate the enantiomers by using a column, which is slow and expensive. Now there are other derivatives of meth where only one enantiomer is also active. For example, cathinone. Now this is the active ingredient in the stimulant cat. Now cat is a plant found naturally in the Arabian Peninsula and the Horn of Africa, where it is used as a stimulant to keep truck drivers awake. The problem with cat farming, however, is if you leave your crop to dry, the cathinone will decompose cathine, a much less active stimulant. Now, cathine is less active even than amphetamine, a drug sold in the US as Adderall. However, interestingly, both enantiomers of amphetamine are active in the medicine. This is the same as MDMA or ecstasy, where both enantiomers are also active as drug molecules. So even these slight chemical changes can affect whether one or both of your enantiomers 
are active. So hopefully you realize that this simple chemical change of which way a single bond goes can have a dramatic effect on how a molecule behaves. To give some context, every five years, weight of a blue whale in methamphetamine is seized. Now that is seized by law enforcement agencies, not produced by criminals. So the effect this simple up or down change has had is massive. Let's finish then by looking at whether any good has come out of medicines becoming drugs by considering if they can go the other way, from drugs to medicines. Well, in the case of methamphetamine, a derivative of it is actually used in Sudafed, another decongestant. Now, interestingly, the side effects of Sudafed can actually include hallucinations, just like methamphetamine. While the addictiveness of heroin and morphine has necessitated the need for opioid-free synthesis to make COVID, to make codeine, a powerful but less addictive painkiller, plus a derivative of one of the enantiomers of heroin, well, that's actually found in night nurse. So some drugs can go back to being medicines as well. In summary then, we have seen why heroin is so addictive and why half of all methamphetamine is inactive. In both cases, it comes down to simple chemical changes that have had world-changing consequences. Thanks for listening, and I'll hand you back to Phil. Thank you so much, Alex. That was an amazing talk. I love the graphics as well. Like, I know it might sound a bit weird to say something like that, but I think sometimes it's so hard to kind of understand these scientific theories that, mm. that come to us through these episodes and having great visuals. It's helped me understand it a lot more. Um, so we are going to take a short break. Um, what I'm going to do is quickly bring up your banner here. So uh, for Ooh. you, for you your Twitter handle on as well. Um, we will be having you back in about five minutes or so um, to do some questions and answers from our audience. If anyone in the audience that's been watching has a question they'd like to ask, just simply comment beneath this live stream video in the comment section and it will come up on screen later. But for now, we're going to say uh, goodbye to Alex. Bye. And let's quickly check in with our wonderful audience. So uh, tonight is a bit of a different night for us because uh, we have had a few technical difficulties, but it's great to see that it hasn't seemed to affect anything. So we've got, um, oh, I recognize this name. Um, we have good evening from Christina Sanderson. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Uh, and another... Here we go. Hello from Bury, from Kenneth Patterson. Hello from Hull. That's currently where I am. The weather is looking slightly all right. What's the weather like in Bury? Um, and we've got, oh, 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 this is lovely. I love this one. Uh, love the dinosaur analogy. I do love a good dinosaur analogy. Um, brilliant. Right. So we're going to be swiftly moving on now. So we're going to be taking a short break. And as I said, we'll be coming back in about five, 10 minutes or so to do our questions and answers. But you don't have to go anywhere because today we've actually got a special guest again. And actually, this is very exciting for me to introduce because I've been a long term fan uh, of our special guest tonight. So he is a TV presenter. Uh, who you may recognize from programs such as The One Show and Brainiac. When he's not on television, however, he is off performing an array of hair-raising and flammable science shows at science festivals around the country, and is a proud author of two books, uh, The Science of Everyday Life, of which three books, sorry, three two. books. <laughs> <laughs> the Science of Everyday Life, which I have here, and it's an amazing read, uh, as well as other books such as The Science of Food. Ladies and gentlemen, please, please, please welcome Marty Jobson. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Phil. Marty Jobson here. Uh, hopefully all the technology is working because um, what I've been doing since lockdown, uh, because obviously I've not been going around festivals and things like that, is I have been live streaming microscopy from my kitchen table here. 
Uh, so Zeiss, the lovely people at Zeiss, they give me these microscopes. They've given me the microscopes and said, go out and enthuse people with microscopy. So that's what I've been doing. And today I just wanted to show you one little specimen that I found in my uh, pond. This is, uh, I shall show you, I've got, I'll move on to this camera here. It is indeed the Hydra, Hydra viridissima, to give it its full Latin name. And these are pretty common. It is a tentacled monster. So let's get it under the microscope. I'll take the lid off. I'll scooch you over to the microscopes there like that. And then I'll put my microscopes on. So I've got two microscopes, this microscope here, this one, it's called a stereo microscope. And uh, let's have a look. Let's see if we can find one of these little beasties. And here is one. You'll notice the pond water is absolutely crammed with stuff. There's a little uh, that it, there's all sorts of things. There's all sorts of uh, that's an ostracod at the bottom down here. This thing down here, by the way, which has nothing to do with this, but that's an ostracod. But this, this is the hydra here. And you might be thinking, oh, the hydra. You remember your Latin sort of uh, your, your, your Greek myths, not Latin, Greek myths. You remember that it, I think it was Hercules that had to go off and slice the head off the hydra. And you might be wondering, well, is that where it gets its name because of all these tentacles? And that's actually not where it gets its name. This is a remarkable creature. It is a cnidarian, which has got a silent C at the beginning, which is very confusing, a cnidarian. Um, it's related to uh, jellyfish so uh, and all that sort of ilk. And it's basically just a tiny little gobbit of jelly that consists of a head with some tentacles, a hold fast that it sticks itself down with. And then in the middle is basically just one long gut. Uh, and it's got a mouth at the top and it's it's stretching itself out. And these things, they'll stretch themselves out. If I give it a gentle poke with uh, this blunted needle, where are you? Somewhere in the middle there, you'll see. Boop. It scooches back into it, so it sort of sucks itself all back in. Now this one, you'll have noticed, it's you can't see it now, it's just starting to reappear. Just here, you'll notice that there is a, um, a little baby. It buds off. Now these things are incredible. They are, it would appear to be, immortal. They don't seem to age. They don't show any of the normal aging processes that you see in anything else. They, and this is quite interesting. I know obviously people are, are using this to find out how that works. But also, and this is actually how they get their name, because if you remember your legends of, of Hercules, the Hydra was uh, sort of 10 headed or 12. I can't remember how many heads it had. And when the head was cut off, two would sprout. And I think it was Hercules had to, was it, or was it Odysseus? I can't remember. Um, but Hercules had to sort of use a burning brand to scorch and stop the new head for me. And these things, if you cut them in half, you will grow two of them. Um, unlike worms, which this, that's, that's a sort of a popular urban myth, these things are genuinely um, able to regrow. So if you slice it sort of there, the top bit would grow a bottom and the bottom bit would grow a top. And even if you sliced it twice, so you ended up with three bits, the top bit would regrow a bottom, the bottom bit would regrow a top, and the middle bit would regrow not only a top, but a bottom. They are what is known as totipotent. If I change the illumination, you can see them a bit better. This is now um, what's known as dark field illumination, um, which works quite well for these little suckers. You can see that there's this little baby growing on it there. Now, I wanted to show you them under a high powered microscope, though. I'm not quite sure how much time I've got. I'm going to ask uh, uh, Phil, just tell me in the chat how much time when I actually started, because I don't want to ramble on too much. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you one of these little things under a different microscope. So stereo microscope, good for seeing relatively small things millimeter size. These things are about a millimeter across. Uh, I am all good. That's what he says. That's what we like to hear. Uh, but this microscope allows us to see much higher resolution and it has a whole load of extra optics on it, which allow me to show you some other cool things. So let's switch to this microscope. <clears throat> I do that and then I do this and there it is. It's upside down, this one. This one is in a, it's in a tiny little, it's called a dimple well on a slide and I'll try and bring it up. So it's, it's sort of upside down, but you, you'll you have to turn it the right way around in your brains. And, and it's growing out uh, as we watch. 
this, by the way, this is over here is just a bubble. Uh, and it, that's unfortunately underneath the cover slip. But this is this is our hydra here. It's, and you can see it doesn't it's squidging itself right back down into there. If you shine the light on it quite brightly, it actually quite likes the bright light. And you can see it's got this green coloration. But I want to show you two things, two cool things. I'm going to zoom in even further on this thing like that. And I want to show you. And now I am showing you this. I'm going to show you one of its tentacles. And I need to freeze frame it. I need to capture it because these things don't like to stay still. So I'm going to just, this is tricksy. Right. I have frozen frame on the tentacle. So here's the main body of the tentacle running down here. And it's green. I'll come to that in a second. And covering it are what are known as nematocysts or niderocytes. And these things are actually the fastest accelerating things on the planet that are um, uh, natural, so to speak. I mean, I suppose we could have unnatural accelerating things. But in terms of biology, they are the fastest accelerating things. And these are the stinging cells. And they have a tiny little trigger hair. And I can just see one there. And there's one there. And basically, the entire outer layer on both sides is nider uh, these niderocytes, these um, nematocytes. And basically what they are, they're inverted needles. And when the trigger hair is triggered, they go poof, and they fly out and they skewer. They've got a long barb. They skewer whatever comes up against them and they inject a neurotoxin and kill it. So they're kind of cool as well. Oh, you can see them really well here. That It happens to be in focus just there. That's its mouth by there, right there. All right, how am I doing? How am I doing? It's about five minutes so far. OK, because I want to show you one other thing. I'll just let it readjust itself because you're thinking to yourself, OK, so it's green. It's a green hydra. Maybe it's got some sort of green pigment in it because most hydra have no pigment in it. But that's not what makes it green. What makes it green is chloroplasts and specifically chlorophyll inside symbiotic algae, single-celled algae. And I can prove that to you because the beautiful thing about this mic this particular microscope is it also has fluorescence capability. So what I can do is I can shine ultraviolet light along here, down here, onto my specimen. And it just so happens that I've got it set up so that I can um, use the right wavelength of ultraviolet light to make chlorophyll fluoresce red. And if I switch that switch there and flip that there like that, boom, there it goes. And all the chlorophyll is now fluorescing bright pinky red. And you can still, oh, it doesn't really like being illuminated with ultraviolet light. So I tend to do this as quickly as possible. But you can see if I get it really well focused, can you see here and here? It's in little tiny dots. It's not evenly spread. If I zoom in a little bit and we focus, you could see, ooh, wrong way. Uh, I need to get it, a, I'll get a lump of it in focus. You can see all of those tiny little dots. And each one of those tiny little dots is a chloroplast inside one of these. Um, and it's it's a thing called chlorella vulgaris. It's a single celled algae that makes it glow uh, pink like that. So there you go. That's all I'm going to tell you. There is the beautiful hydra um, glowing under ultraviolet light. Um, if you want to find out more about my uh, microscopy, I've done loads and loads of microscopy, go to my YouTube channel. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, where I post, and actually the live streams go out on Twitter, you can find me on Twitter. So I've probably run over. It's a bad habit of mine. Um, I think that's about all the time I've got for. So um, I'm going to say goodbye. I have to now go and cook dinner for everyone. Thank you very much. That's me. Thank you so much once again, Marty. Um, that was just incredible. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, once again, please hear it for the wonderful, the magnificent Marty Jobson. Thank you very much. Right. Well, uh, again, just incredible to watch that. In fact, uh, since knowing that Marty was going to be on our show, I have been watching his YouTube channel more or less every day for his little micro minute. I would definitely recommend uh, going to check that out.
Uh, there is a few things on there that have even made me think a little bit differently about things that are in my kitchen, such as the salt, pepper, and even flour. But I'm not going to spoil anything. Go check it out. Uh, so just before we bring back Alex, just let's have a quick look, seeing what's been happening in the comments section. And oh, we've got uh, Kenneth Patterson's reply to me. It's a, it's a brick grey, but it's stopped raining. Glad to hear that. Uh, I think it's more or less looking like blue skies at the moment here in Hull. Uh, please do keep those coming in. We've also got uh, another person. Hello from Finland, from uh, Angelika Polak. Uh, hello from Finland. Wow. I'm not even going to try and pronounce the, uh, lo the, the place name in that comment, but it's amazing to see that we've got people tuning in from Finland. Please tell us how the weather is in Finland. Would love to know more. Right. So without further ado, we're actually going to invite our amazing speaker back into the show tonight. So please, once again, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Alex Baker. Hello again. Hello. How's it going? Uh, not too bad, seeing some of the questions and desperately trying to think of good answers to them. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well... Before we actually ask their questions, uh, I'm going to actually start. I'm going to ask my own question. It's a bit of a yep. slight mean question um, because I know it's not quite the field that you're in. And I know this kind of breaches out more into sort of the, the, the medical side of it. Yeah. Um, obviously, we use drugs a lot for, for just about everything. And, and painkillers mm -hmm. is is a, such a – well, obviously, it's a drug that we need to use, but it can also be such an addictive drug itself. Mm. Um have you come across anything that is kind of a promising light at the end of the tunnel? Maybe a, a drug that, you know, the addiction level is a lot lower, but it has a similar effect. Is there any sort of research into this or is it just a price we have to pay? So I, it really depends how your painkiller works. So there are sort of painkillers more like paracetamol, ibuprofen that has some painkiller effects. So paracetamol, has no chemical addictive properties. It's the kind of the psychological effect of getting the pain relief that can potentially make you addicted to it. So in fact, paracetamol is a, a fantastic painkiller. It's just not very strong. Um, you tend to run into problems when you start getting these really powerful painkillers because they have to have drastic effects on your body and really affect your brain chemistry. So there, there was some work around uh, I think it was the American government in the 60s were really interested in that. And they were actually looking at the enantiomers of heroin, where I showed you that one in Night Nurse. So that was where that one came from. And they were kind of adding different groups to morphine to try and find uh, the same painkilling ability, but trying to sort of tone down its addictive properties. So I would say without someone coming up with a completely brand new compound, it will be hard because using the mechanism that morphine reacts by, I would say you're probably always going to get those addictive effects. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we look to the future and we hope for uh, less addictive ones. But I think for the moment, there isn't really this addiction free opium like compound that we that we really want. Um, but paracetamol is a really good example of an excellent painkiller um, that actually is not addictive, um, apart from in psychological instances. Yeah, it's weird, actually. I never think of paracetamol as a painkiller. I just think of it mm. as a headache pill. Um, and I think that's probably <laughs> some, some marketing, some bad marketing, yeah. or not necessarily bad marketing, but just from what I've seen on the television. Uh, so we are going to ask a few questions from our audience just to let everyone who is watching, uh, if you do want to, if you have a question and you want that answered, please just comment beneath this live feed and we will bring it up on screen. Uh, so we have one question here from uh, Jessica L., uh, great thought, Alex. It's always great to start with a compliment. Uh, <laughs> talked about repurposing drugs as medicines. What do you think the potential for cannabis is as a medicine? Also, love the T-Rex analogy. Oh, I mean, thanks for the, in, enjoying the T-Rex analogy. Uh, <laughs> I mean, cannabis is a whole talk <laughs> in itself. So in cannabis, there are something like, there are over 400 different compounds in cannabis. Uh, um, I th there are about 80 of those that we think have the, the actual effect that when you smoke cannabis, 
that's what gives you the the hallucinations, the pain killing effects, all of that kind of stuff. Um, there are 20 that have been studied in detail. That includes THC, which is the sort of you know the big one where you know I, I think I saw a water brand saying, oh, we put zero 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 point percent of whatever THC in our water, and they were then selling it for 10 times the price. I think there is potential in looking at these compounds, uh, but we have to do it in a controlled way. I think there is real hope for certain cannabis um, derivatives, certainly the work around epilepsy. I think we need to stop being so scared of uh, using these compounds just because they are linked to cannabis. I mean, heroin is linked to morphine, but we still use morphine every day in the NHS. Um, so I think there is hope for certain um, what, what are known as cannabinoids, which are these active compounds from cannabis. So, yeah, I think there's some repurposing there. There's some more research we need to do because nature is so much better at chemistry than we are and has so many excellent compounds that we just have to find them and work out how to make them in large enough amounts. Um, I mean, that's where aspirin comes from. After all, it's salicylic acid with a simple acetyl group on using the same reaction that makes heroin. So, yeah, I reckon there's hope. <laughs> I do love that as well, how nature is a genius. And a lot oh, of the yeah. stuff that we yeah. do, that we you know, claim to have created have actually just found in nature a lot of yeah. the time. Yeah. Um, so, again, an, another question that's a bit of a sideline question because um, uh, your your area of expertise, obviously, is in, um, is in organic chemistry. Um, this one, I think, again, is a bit more of a medical question, but I'm going to bring it up anyway. It's from Sarah Huey. Uh, question for Alex. I use Sudafed when I have a cold, and it's brilliant. The leaflet says not to use it for more than seven days. Why is this? Now, again, I think this is a <laughs> question. <laughs> so it's a bit of a throwing you in the deep end a little bit there, I'm afraid, Alex. I mean, um, I have no idea. You'd have to ask my sister, who's um, currently an A&E doctor. Um, but I would offer potentially two things. Either it's going to be that over time it does contain an opioid, so we don't want you taking them in the long term, um, and really you shouldn't be taking these short-term medicines in the long term, or it's going to be, I've completely forgotten what I was going to say, um, that, it, <laughs> that it possibly has some opioid-like side effects. Um, so either it's going to be you build a tolerance, and can then become addictive, or it's going to be over time these side effects might become more likely. I guess because you can kind of open that to the the broader question of of these more uh, pain killing drugs, mm. uh, such as morphine. Like if you use that for too much, like is there a cutoff point where addiction is more likely? Uh, is it just general prolonged use? Is it different from person to person? It's, so. So the BNF, which is the British National Formulary, and I've got to get that right, um, recommends, uh, has has a day limit on it because it is addictive. It's not as addictive as heroin, as we've seen, um, but over time you will develop um, an addiction and a dependency on it, and it will just become less effective. So another interesting thing about paracetamol, another painkiller, is that over time the effects of paracetamol don't seem to deteriorate. Whilst if we keep giving you opioids, the effect does deteriorate. And we don't quite know why yet. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there, there's a limit of it becomes less effective, and then we should put you on something else, maybe codeine, which we know is less addictive, but very powerful, and also dependency. Yeah. Because that's also sometimes the case with, with coffee as well, um, <laughs> which uh, the more you have of coffee, the, the less it works, the more you need of yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and it's weird because we, we we focus on drugs. And when we think of drugs, we're thinking of, of course, things like morphine and heroin, mm. things like theobromide, which is the drug found in chocolate, which makes chocolate mm. addictive, um, and caffeine as well, which we often, again, just like paracetamol, only think it's for headaches. We just remove those from the equation a lot of the time. Yeah. 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 So we've got a question here. I think we have time for one last question. Uh, we'll see how we get along. This is from Alex Avery. Um, other than the Bayer slash heroin story, have there been other occasions where pharmaceutical companies have manufactured and sold illicit substances? If so, what were the what were they trying to make uh, to begin with? Uh, I mean, there are there are lots of 
good stories. So LSD, um, so that was made, I think, by a Swiss researcher. And it was only when he accidentally ingested it, how you accidentally ingest something in your own lab, who knows? Um, and he then discovered its effect. But I think he was trying to, he was looking at these, not so much the psychedelic properties, but how you could potentially use it for depression, anxiety, those sorts of things. Um, then you've got things like uh, not so much a medicine, but things like radium condoms in the past, where you know when when we discovered radium, we were kind of like, this will sell. We'll put radium in condoms, which of course you know putting <laughs> radioactive material next to your genitals is probably not a good idea. Uh, you've got insecticides like DDT, where we you have companies spraying them on children and saying, look, the child is fine. There's no problem with me spraying this insecticide on children. Of course, later they developed huge problems. Uh, yeah, and then you have even things like uh, stuff that Fritz Haber made back in the 30s where he was intending to make, well, alongside chemical warfare agents, his work with nitrogen fixation. But that, of course, then led to things like Zyklon B that would be used in in the Holocaust and things like that. Um, so yeah, there are loads of examples, some really horrifying examples of where people have set out to do good um, and it has gone horribly, horribly wrong um, and cost thousands and thousands of lives. Yeah. I, I actually watched a film uh, a couple of weeks ago called um, uh, The Dark Waters, which is a recent film with Mark Ruffalo about the mm. Uh, a chemical that was used in, in non-stick pans and the environmental and, and health effects. Well, Teflon, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's not just even with drugs, is it? It can be oh, yeah. any material. Um, and it's it's just really interesting to sort of hear about these stories. And I think uh, a lot of, um, from what I, I remember, a lot of um, government agencies that monitor these um, drugs and foods and substances like that can't often step in and change or, or prevent uh, something going out until an incident has actually happened, yeah. which seems ridiculous when you think mm. about it. But Well, so one, one example you mentioned is Teflon. So the guy who made these, oh, what are they? They're hydrofluorocarbons. So you stick them in your fridge as well. You can put them on, on pans, but in your fridge, they're a great uh, way to cool stuff down very quickly. But the guy who invented them of course, we now don't release them into our atmosphere because they are horrendous greenhouse um, gases and destroy the earth. And they, he also made, uh, I think it was leaded petrol. Um, so at the time, this guy was hailed as you know a hero of his made petrol in a way that we can use it in a car and has made stuff for fridges and freezers, has made nonstick pads. This guy is amazing. Now we look back on his work and we go, wow, this guy has helped destroy the ozone layer in multiple <laughs> ways. So really, you know, Science is, is about discovery, and there are just as ma many bad discoveries as there are good discoveries. <laughs> and sometimes you don't find out until 20, 30 years later when we've done a bit more research. Well, yeah, that's that's the danger as well, I guess, is that you, you can't instantly know everything that yeah. will happen. Um, anyway, once again, we have now run out of time, or we're pushing towards the end of the time. So I just want to say thank you so much, Alex, for coming on today. Uh, I think this comment sums it up um you know thank you <laughs> simple, <laughs> thank, you simple. Again. thank you uh it has been amazing having you on our show it's been an amazing talk i'm just going to bring up your uh twitter handle once again uh if people have more questions that they would like to ask you uh i would you mind if people tweeted you oh directly? yeah you know tweet me it will give me something to do tomorrow in the lab when i'm <laughs> slowly um taking off a load of solvents so yeah i'll happily answer questions <laughs> Fantastic. So any more questions, please get in touch uh, using Twitter. Um, and once again, please, just a massive round of applause. Raise the roof for Alex Baker. Cheers, Phil. Absolute Thank pleasure. <laughs> right. Uh, so let's quickly check in with a few more comments that we've had here. Oh, we've had another thank you from Debbie Green. Debbie, you are more than welcome. Uh, hi from Brazil, from Jessica Baptista. Uh, and we've had a response from Finland. Uh, Angelica uh, says that it was amazing to watch everything. What's the weather like? Days are warm, 20 plus degrees at the evenings. Temperatures drop. Wow. Kind of wish I was in Finland right now. Uh, thank you once again for tuning in, and uh, Angelica. And uh, I'm glad you enjoyed the show. 
Uh, and another thank you from Heather Hanger. Right. So this does bring us to the end of our show. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And thank you to both uh, Alex Baker from the University of Warwick and Marty Jobson for being involved. Both are amazing guests. Uh, and you don't have to wait too long for another cup of science because we are back next week. Same time, same places. Next week, we are going to be uh, venturing into the solar system with a talk on the James Webb telescope. Uh, space telescope which i've got an advertisement there there you go so you can find out more about what is coming next week by visiting our website which is pintoscience.co.uk um, or you can follow us on twitter at pint of science uh, hashtag pint 20 or hashtag pint uh, hashtag cup of science uh, and of course, you can contact me directly if you have any of your questions uh, at Philby91. So that it is, uh, that is it from us for now. We've had a few final comments coming in, which is great to see. Uh, really interesting talks. Thank you from Sheffield. Thank you, Geraldine, uh, for, for tuning in. It's, it's really nice to see you here. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you next week, as well as everyone else who has been here tonight. So that is it from me. I'll leave you. Uh, and have a wonderful weekend. Again, hopefully see you next week. Bye for now.